don't cover, don't carry from the top. That's why that happens. Okay. There you go. Get in your position where you're supposed to be. And it's all stand, amen. Let's take our song books to page 304. We'll sing Nothing Between, amen. Page 304. Page 304. We'll sing Nothing Between, amen. On that first verse, here we go. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world, delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine, there's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, let nothing between. Nothing between like worldly pleasure, habits of life, though harm as they seem, must not my heart from him ever sever. He is my all, there's nothing between, nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, let nothing between. Nothing between, like pride or like station. Self or friend shall not intervene. Though it may cost me much tribulation. I am resolved, there's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. So that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, let nothing between. Nothing between her many hard trials, though the whole world against me convene. Watching with prayer and much self denial, I'll trump at last with nothing between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. So that his blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, let nothing be tween. Amen. Amen. Go to page 412, and we'll sing Onward, Christian Soldiers. Amen. We've been saying this one in a while. It might be a little bit rusty, but that's okay. Page 412, we'll sing Onward, Christian Soldiers. Are we Christian soldiers? Amen. Are we soldiers for Christ? Amen. And we sing like it. Amen. On page 412. Here we go. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. <coughs> Master. Leads against a foam Forward into battle To his banner go Onward Christian soldiers Marching as to war With the cross of Jesus Going on before the sign of triumph 
Satan's host of flee. On then Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices, loud your anthems raise. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus, going on before. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus, going on reform. Onward then, ye people, join our happy throng. Blend with all your voices in the triumph song. Glory, Lord, and honor unto Christ the King. This through countless ages, men and angels sing. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus, going on before. Amen. Amen. All right. We are here tonight. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you we can be in this place. Yeah. Be here with the folks here, Lord, to, to hear the Word of God. Thank you that you give us a King James Bible. We can uh, preach out of, read, uh, study, yeah. and Lord, and just to worship you, to give us a direction on how to, and how to be conformed to your image. And we'll give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Be seated. All right, everybody got a bulletin? You'd like to have a bulletin, you don't have a bulletin? Praise the Lord, we'll give you a bulletin. If you're interested in a bulletin. So, praise the Lord for that. Let's see here. Amen, Miss, we praying for Miss Dora, she's sick now. She got the same thing Miss Dora, Lori had, Miss Lori shared. She's sharing, sharing is caring. Well, in our bulletin, it tells us that we're going to be having the youth rally at True Vine Baptist Church on the 19th. So if you want, I think it's 6801 Glen, uh, West Glendale Avenue. That's 6801 West Glendale Avenue. <laughs> you just go to Glen, to go down Glendale till you come to 67. Take a, actually it's the easiest way, take a left at 67, take the next right, and you go down like an alley into their property and uh, that's the best way to get in there 67th Avenue oh I don't know I don't pay attention I barely pay attention to 67th Avenue the 6801 is his address to take the next right and you go behind the houses there and go right into the gate at their church. They're 6801 because there's a road that, that alley goes like this and then turns and I guess that's considered a street. Oh, you would turn before you got to 67th Avenue. Well, you can turn that, you can turn that way, yes. We're, we're, we're talking on where we come from this part of town. <laughs> But if you uh, go past 67th Avenue, it would be on the left, and you can try to make a left-hand turn in there, but you may have problems. So that, well, you know, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you, you'll have problems. Like, 
All right, so youth rally. It's at 10 o'clock on Saturday. And so uh, then we also have uh, church cleanup on the following Saturday at 9 a.m. here till 12. We'll supply a lot. Well, we'll supply a snack or something because they're going to have food at the baby Bacinus reveal party, which is at 2:30. So we don't want to get you too full and miss out on that. And so be there. Everyone's invited to that. February 8th is family night, and the 16th is swap meet. And then you got mission conference. We got mission conference already coming up. Brother Geckler be here. Got some missionaries coming. And uh, our missionary of the week is uh, Brother Carter. He's there in uh, Arkansas. And uh, these birthdays, Bible reading, prayer, you do all that kind of stuff. Getting right with God, handing out tracts, and witnessing. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know what I'm going to do one of these days? I'm just going to have to. I, you know what? I still, in my heart, when, when we were in Honduras, 2002 you can you believe we flew right after 9 11 <laughs> what were we thinking but uh we flew and by the way there was a guy on the that plane that had a turban on and one of our guys says said to the guy he didn't hold anything back you try anything and we're killing you <laughs> this is on the plane <laughs> oh and i think everybody applauded him kind of a thing but <laughs> but so what ended up happening was they say that's hate speech now do you know that they say it's hate speech so, uh, but it, you know, hey, if I if uh, if I find a, a bomb pack strapped to some Muslim, I'm killing him. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm going. I'm going to do all I can to keep him from being able to blow up the place. And uh, if I, I mean, you might as well because he's going to blow you up. You might as well get as close as you can <laughs> when the bomb goes off. If he's going to blow you up, either that or stop him from blowing everybody up. See, people don't understand. That's not hate speech. That's protection. <laughs> Trying to protect yourself and family and whoever else is around you. So they call it hate speech. So what you know, a guy's gonna blow a place up and you say, Hey, you get you you, you put down the bomb or we're gonna kill you, you know, we're gonna shoot you. Oh, you hate him. No, I hate the fact that he's gonna blow the place up. <laughs> I mean, who's the hater here really? <laughs> Common sense is not in America anymore. Common sense left the coast, amen? It's gone somewhere, somewhere, but it's not in America. And very few people have common sense anymore, it seems like. And either that or it's hidden. But we weren't talking about that. What were we talking about? Oh, well, just do what's right, amen? Let's take Let's take up our building fund offering. Just take up our building fund offering. Let's do that right now. Take a building fund offering. <clears throat> take a building fund offering. Uh -huh. Take a building fund offering. Yeah, rebellious. Thinking rebellious person. So that's how he listens to me at home too. So you know, I'm used to it. Who? Praise the Lord, and they can stay there. Like one guy said today, I heard this guy say this, and it was funny. He says, I'm hopping around like a frog with a with a hot foot. <laughs> I said, That's a good line, man. I'm hopping around like a frog with a hot foot. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's pretty hoppy. <laughs> Amen. I thought that was a good line. Some people come up with some good lines, man. I like it. I like it. American discounts. My wife is, I'm not going there. I don't eat frog legs. Oh, are they? If you like frog legs, that's like saying then sushi is delicious. I don't eat sushi. <laughs> Look at I like my fish cooked and I like my I like my seafood not jumping around, amen. <laughs> I like fish and fish. And I like crab. I have to admit I like I like shrimp. I know, people say it tastes like chicken. <laughs> Slimy? <laughs> Easier to slide down. 
So basically, it's like oysters. <laughs> like oysters. Oh, I hate oysters. I don't like, I won't eat oysters. I won't eat clam. I'll eat clam and clam chowder, but I won't eat clam just by themselves. I used to have friends that eat the clams and the oysters raw. They just open them up and just slide them down. Man, it was no big deal. I watched one guy eat 20 of those things. And I was like, really? Because up in Washington, you catch them by the, by the, I mean, they're, they, they come and ask you to take them. <laughs> they climb them, come up to your legs. Hey, take us. Seriously, we used to go out with gunny sacks. That's how much we knew we were going to bring back. Gunny sacks. Gunny sacks of, of clams and so forth. And gunny sacks, they used to be about this tall, this big around. And uh, we bring back three, four bags of those. And we'd sit all day breaking them open. They'd fight back because they're still alive, you know. They'd fight back. they squirt at you. they clamp down on you. <laughs> you get your finger, ah! <laughs> it was fun. they get in there. But those guys would open those things up and just swallow them whole. And I'm like, they're alive now. They're not cooking them. That's like swallowing goldfish. I'm not doing that either. When they told us in Bible college you have to swallow goldfish, not this guy. No way. You're rebellious. No, I don't eat goldfish live, especially. No way. Look at that's worse than sushi. <laughs> no way. No way. Look at I am not a human fish tank. <laughs> I am not swallowing live fish. No way. I'll be telling you, that fish would be going off Mount Vesuvius. But, I mean, we're talking to go down, come back just as fast as it went down. <laughs> There's no way. There's some things I can handle, but that's that and oysters, frog legs, <laughs> squid. No, I mean, squid. Squid's nasty. Seaweed is nasty. Man was never even meant to eat seaweed unless he was a fish. <laughs> seaweed tastes exactly like it sounds. <laughs> See, it tastes like a sea and is a weed. Amen. <laughs> sea, seaweed. All right, let's go ahead. Get it. Let's take up our offering. Amen. I'm not eating as a. But frog legs are on. Uh, they have them at uh, American Discount if you want frog legs. <laughs> uh, I know some of you might want to eat them. I know Bob, he's going to go get cases of them. I know. She likes anything like this. She likes strange stuff. So look at it. She married my son. <laughs> it's like strange stuff. Amen. <laughs> no, Miss Chow. No, Miss Chow wasn't here. We were in Kogo. All righty. Well, let's, let's pray. Uh, Elijah, pray for us, please. Jesus' feet were growing weary as he journeyed on his way. So he rested at the well side, a comfort in the heat of day. There he waited for a woman, black with sin and bound for hell. When she arrived, he plainly told her, what you need's not in the well. He's been waiting by the well, and he's holding out his hand. If you drink this living water, you won't have to thirst again. He's still waiting by the well side, knowing you'd be passing by. So take advantage of the moment. He's not gone, he's still waiting by the well. Are you tired of being thirsty, even though you've had your fill? Of the water that the world gives, does it leave you long and still? Where there's good news about the well side, a woman's voice rings loud and clear. She said, this man changed her forever, and if you need hope, you can find it here. He's been waiting by the well. 
and he's holding out his hand. If you drink this living water, you will have to thirst again. He's still waiting by the well side, knowing you'll be passing by. So take advantage of the moment. He's not gone, he's still waiting by the well. He's been waiting by the well, and he's holding out his hand. If you drink this living water, you won't have to thirst again. He's still waiting by the well side, knowing you'll be passing by. So take advantage of the moment. He's not gone, he's still waiting by the well. Amen. Good job. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, we do. We love Ron. She didn't have very much to give, nothing that you could recall. A widow without very much to give, only two mites, that's all. But a story came down through the ages how she gave more than she could afford. She didn't have very much to give, but she gave it all to the Lord. Some give up their abundance, some sacrificially. We must give with the heart of thanks for the blessings we receive. We cast our bread upon the water, watch our blessings come to shore. We may not have very much to give, but we give it all to the Lord. He didn't have very much to give, a boy with two fish and some bread. He didn't have very much to give, but with this so many were fed. Jesus took what was offered and then he made a miracle as his reward. He didn't have very much to give, but he gave it all to the Lord. Some give up their abundance, some sacrificially. We must give with a heart of thanks for the blessings we receive. We cast our bread upon the water, watch our blessings come to shore. We may not have very much to give, but we give it all to the Lord. We may not have very much to give, but we gave it all to the Lord, the Lord. Amen. Amen. I want the men to work on uh, getting a song. I heard they had some problems and struggles, so get unstruggled and get unproblemed and get it done. Amen. Praise the Lord. So that's just a note of encouragement, amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's open our Bibles, the book of Proverbs. Uh, that's probably my favorite book in the Bible. Proverbs gives you wisdom. I tell people, Psalm, the book of Psalms is the heart of God, and the book of Proverbs is the mind of God. So it's his mind. It's his wisdom. And uh, it's interesting, Proverbs 13, open up to that. It's Psalms is right in the middle of the Bible. You know that. It's where the heart is. Right in the middle of the body. And the mind's right next to it. Isn't that funny? And it gives you wisdom. Now, I've had a lot of people say, Solomon didn't write all of, of uh, Proverbs. And they'll go to Proverbs 31 and a few other Proverbs, like Proverbs 30 or 29. And, uh, but let me read something to you real quick. Verse 1 of Proverbs 1.1. 1, 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. I don't know. That's what it says. It says the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. That's one of the first verses I memorized, that verse right there. See, I looked up the other names they have there, and every one of them, when I looked them up, said it's another name for Solomon. I don't know. 
I just go by my studying and what I find. And so I just trying to just trying to help you. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to be wrong on it. I mean, I want I want God's truth to come out. I want people to know the truth. For the truth shall set you free, right? No. What does it do? Makes you free. There's a difference between setting and making. Hmm? You know what? The, 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 that's two different words. You know that, right? Set. It's like this. I played uh, I played uh, um, volleyball. I played Olympic-style volleyball. Me and my wife both did. Can you believe it? And I can't jump. I, I couldn't I couldn't jump out of bed. <laughs> I mean, we really we really had springboards for legs then. And that, seriously, I get up I get about this far above the net back in those days. And you had to if you're going to block shots and stuff. But there was a thing called a set in volleyball. And you set the ball up, you weren't you weren't hitting the ball over the net, you were setting it up for another guy to hit it over. And sometimes you set it up several times before the ball went over the net. You get three hits on each side. And so you may set it up twice. Or you may set it up for someone else, and then he sets it back up for you, and then you hit it over. Or someone else does. And it's called a set. Okay? It's putting it in place. It's, it's like you're, you're, you're uh, putting it in, in play, but on your side of the net. But to make... You want to make a score, that ball's going over the net. And sometimes hard. We played a Japanese team, man. I, I couldn't, I thought we were playing Superman. I'm not joking. I mean, each one of them, I think, had super strength. I'm not joking. They could, they jump up to the net about knee height. Their knee was at the top of the net. I said, how'd you do that? And the whole funny thing about it was the whole team would jump at the same time. <laughs> and you're like, where do you put the ball? <laughs> and that's what went through your mind when you're going to make a point. Mm -hmm. Make a point and try to score against them. And the same thing with, with uh, make you free. God is it's in the process of doing that, and it's a making. It's a creation. Setting, like we set concrete, like we set a post, that's not making. Like we set someone free, like you let them out of prison, out of a cage, or let your dog out of the cage and let them run around or something, or let them out of the dog run, let them run around the yard or whatever. You're setting them free. But we're making them free. That means you're the creator of freedom. So they're wrong when they say set free. That's all there is to it. Words mean a lot to God. They say, no, it's just the meaning, not the words. No, it's the words. Huh? The words. I was thinking about that today. Uh, when they take away, you've been able to define words in the scripture. When they take away, you've been able to say, this is what this word means which they do, these NIV guys and so forth, because they got so many different perverted, uh, perversions of the scriptures that say so many different things. You can't define a word if you preach out of their books or you preach, everybody's got a different version, perversion. You can't define a word, so they take away about one-third of your preaching. Let's see, one-third one of your teaching, one-third of your learning, because the definition of words are very important. God uses words on purpose to define what he's saying. So words, he never says memorize my thoughts or what I mean. He says memorize my word. Memorize it. He says, he, he tells you to read his word, not read his thoughts, not read what his motives are. Because <laughs> that's what they say about the NIV. Well, it's the thought that counts. No, it ain't. It's not the thought. It's what God has said. His words, actual words, what do they mean? What do they say? See, they, the, the devil has done a good job at neutralizing Christians from believing truth. And it's so subtle and so easy to believe a lie. That's why you stay to the King James Bible, so you can stay as close to the truth as you can. Proverbs 13. Let's stand. By the way, that's why I use Pro Book of Proverbs. You should read it every day. It'll give you wisdom. You'll all of a sudden be shocked at what you know from reading Proverbs all the time. Even if you don't pick up everything, you, you, your, your heart will soak it in, and your mind will, will bring it into your heart, and your soul will be fed. And next thing you know, you're going, I shouldn't do that. Why not? Because the Bible says so. <laughs>
Man, that's, that's just wrong. Huh? But why do you think so many Christians who are truly believers think that the left is wrong, the progressives are wrong, the socialists are wrong, the communists are wrong? Huh? Why do you think? Because they know that's not, that's not even go li in line with the scriptures. By the way, before we go on, I saw a video of Donald Trump on the border. It was a good video. And there's a guy, one of the guys heading up the, there in Texas, heading up uh, the border patrol is a well-spoken Hispanic man. And he's for Donald Trump, and he's for the wall, and I love it. And Donald Trump looked at him when he got done speaking. He goes, have I ever talked to you? And he goes, no. He says, but you said exactly what I would have said. He says, I couldn't have said it any better. That's what he said. And, uh, and he says, these guys want the wall down here. <laughs> Amen. What I'm just saying is he's not a racist. He's not all against all the Mexicans. Hey, look, at, they, they said how many people came into our country just today tried to get across the border uh, in that one spot where they were at in Texas. 138. 138 illegals. They caught them all. Two of them were from Pakistan. That's the Middle East, you know, terrorist, you know, Muslim kind of thing, carry bombs across the border kind of thing. Huh? Most of them weren't from Mexico or Central, uh, Central uh, uh, America or southern, the southern part of uh, America, the south part of, uh, what do you call it, uh, Central and, what do they call that down there? No, they don't call it. What do they call that down south of uh, Central America? Do they call it Southern Amer so South America? Thank you. I don't know why my bl mind went blank. But they, most of them came from other countries. China, huh? India, Indonesia, huh? Pakistan. That's what they, where they caught them. They, all these guys were caught. And they said the reason it is because they, that's the weakest part of our country, on the, that border right there on the south. That's why Trump wants to put a bull. Well, that's just a side note. I think it should be done. I think it needs to be done. And I think those liberals, if they don't want, if they don't want to concede, why don't they just dig a trench and bury them all in there and put the wall on top of them? <laughs> Amen. I hate to be mean, but the, man, because they are just they are just a hindrance to our nation. A hindrance. Boy, if George Washington was here and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and all these guys, those guys would have been all lined up against the wall by now and would all wouldn't exist. I'm not joking. You read some of their writings. They didn't believe in treason. <laughs> they believe in protecting America. They believe in America having rights. I mean, inalienable, inalienable rights, they say in our Constitution. Uh, inalienable rights. Okay, I've got to get that word right. They believed, that they believed in us having freedom and liberty, not bondage. So, praise the Lord. How would they get on that? But I believe God believes the same thing. Let's read Proverbs verse 16 of chapter 13. It says this, Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. Our Heavenly Father, help us understand what we just read and what we're going to hear tonight in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. You can be seated. Here we see a prudent man. How many prudent men... Deal with knowledge. Every. That's what the Bible says. Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge. Now we're not talking knowledge of this old world, knowledge of our public school system, knowledge of our universities and colleges and those, those things alike. He's talking about knowledge of the Word of God. Now let me ask you a question and you can answer it to yourself and in your heart. But, do you deal with knowledge? I mean, do you open up this book on a daily basis and deal with knowledge of God's Word? Do you study His Word to gain knowledge? Do you listen to the preaching so you can gain knowledge? Do you uh, listen to uh, maybe preaching on tape? Uh, on, uh, on, well, nowadays it's not tape. It's, it's, it could be CDs. It could be Internet or whatever. Do you listen to that so you can gain knowledge? Do you look for knowledge? It says, every prudent man dealeth with knowledge. So let me ask you a question. If you're not dealing with knowledge, if you're not seeking knowledge, if you don't want the knowledge of God's Word, then you don't fit in this category. You're not a prudent man. 
You're, you're, what are you then if you're not prudent? But a fool lays open his folly. You know how to tell if you're a fool? What comes out of your mouth when the cup is spilled, like I said this morning? What comes out of your mouth when pressure's put on you? Hmm? That's when you're going to find out what you are. And make you a fool, man. I've been a many a foolish Christians that, that blow off steam, comes out of their mouth, and says everything that should not be said. <laughs> not, uh, not one thing was, was uh, edifying to the person they were talking to. Not one thing was lifting a man up. Not one thing was uh, constructive criticism. It was tear down. I heard one guy say this. He said this today. It's easy to tear a man down, but it's hard to lift him up. And he said more Christians should more often lift someone up than tear him down. Hmm. Christ would like you, you to lift somebody up. Well, Christ would try to lift you up. Yeah, when you got saved, he lifted you up, lifted you out of that wicked pit that you were in. Huh? He told you you could do it now. You got Christ living in you. He gave you all the, the goods to be a, a successful and prosperous Christian. He encouraged you even in your sin when you first got saved. He encouraged you to do right. He is with his soft voice. He spoke to you and encouraged you to go on and do right. Don't give up. Don't quit. Huh? But every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. I think of laying open his follies like, like cutting, up, cutting a fish open. I, I used to clean fish all the time. Wasn't a, I didn't really like the job, but it was my job. And I'd gut them, and, and uh, we did, they wanted them whole. They didn't, want them, they didn't want them skinned. They didn't want them flayed. So I'd cut them open, cut off the head from the back of the, back of the, the gills uh, forward to the head, cut the head off scale them, and then package them. But I always think about when I cut them open, you, flayed, you, you laid them open so you can gut them, so you can clean them. And that's what a, fall, what a, fall, a fool does. He opens up his folly, he just lays himself open. <laughs> he, he just has no defense. Wide open to be destroyed. No, everybody knows everything about him. Huh? There, he's got a reputation and it's not a good one. Because he's told so many people what his folly is. And without really saying, this is my folly. And people look at him as fools. The Bible says, uh, in a multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. But it's funny how fools just can't keep quiet sometimes. They just can't keep quiet. You don't have to have an opinion about everything and everybody. Hmm? You don't have to. I don't find that in Scripture you have to have an opinion about everything. Jesus Christ didn't have an opinion about everything, or at least he didn't express his opinion about everything. There was times that he just was quiet. Hmm? <laughs> he just was quiet. He didn't say things. And it, wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt Christians to learn that. We need to deal with knowledge. See, man needs to conform to God and not God conform to man. A fool will make God or try to get God to conform to his ways or live according to a fool's life, conforming to letting God conform to him or try to get God to conform to him and saying, he is right, I'm right with God because even though I'm a fool, <laughs> he didn't say that, but he, even though he's a fool, I'm doing what's right. He's conforming God to his image. And instead, we're supposed to conform to his image. And how do we do that? By being in the word of God, by being under the knowledge of God's word. Every prudent man deals with knowledge. This verse talks about a prudent man and a foolish man. The prudent man makes all his decisions on knowledge. Hmm? All his decisions. He'll, he'll, he'll do it on knowledge. Not knowledge from the school, the educational system, but from the Holy Ghost Bible learning system. As God teaches him, by the way, listen to me carefully. If you've never been taught by the Holy Ghost, you haven't been taught. 
You'll know if you've been taught by the Holy Ghost of God. Because it's different than for them being just taught and accepting knowledge by your flesh, by your mind, by educational system, by the teachers that are teaching you. The Holy Ghost will teach you and convince you with the knowledge that he gives you. Some of you don't even understand that. He's done that to me so many times. That's why you'll conform. That's why you'll change. That's why you'll learn. But see, here's the key. You've got to yield. If you don't yield to the Holy Ghost, you'll never gain the knowledge of the Lord. Healing to the Holy Ghost is hard. You know what the healing to the Holy Ghost is? Yes, sir. I think I better change that. My wife and I often, I'll say, I'll say to her, I'll say, I think God wants us to do that. He goes, she go, oh, yeah, he's been talking to me about that too. Guess what? Well, now we say, yes, sir. Why? Because now we know it's God speaking to us. He's got us both, husband and wife, in unison of what truth he wants us to know. And uh, sometimes my wife will say, and not just her, I'll do the same thing to her, but she'll say to me, and she'll say, I think we need to do this. I said, God hasn't led me that way. Well, right there, we're not to follow. It. Why? Because, first of all, I'm the leader of the home. But then, by the way, I don't tear her down for, for knowing that or saying that. She's just, and, and thought came to her, an inkling of, of something that she thought we should do, and she's just bringing it to me and finding out, bouncing it off me to find out if this is what God wants us to do. I always use the illustration when, when I was uh, with the Reclamation Ranch and I was praying, and God said, uh, have you ever thought about going back into pastoring? And I said, no, nah, that must be my own mind. Then my wife comes to my office a few minutes later and says, hey, have you ever thought about going back into pastoring? You know what? I couldn't find in the Bible where it says I was supposed to go back in pastoring. But it was the Holy Ghost was there and he was telling me. And then he told my wife because I wasn't listening. <laughs> and then I knew right then when she told it to me, the Holy Spirit says, that's it. And I came down here. Look at it. A Holy Ghost-led person doesn't go on assumptions or hearsay. And by the way, I've seen so many Christians go on assumptions and hearsays. You come into my house and just come in and open up my refrigerator and start eating my food, you're going to see the door slammed on your hand. Why? Because you are assuming you can get in my refrigerator. But that's what we do with Christianity. We assume things that this is, this is what this person is doing or how this person is acting. And, or we... We have, a, we have a hearsay from somebody else that this is what they're doing and we will act upon it as if it's the word of God. Amen. But see, you've got to watch out. You might be talking to someone who's trying to destroy another man. You don't know their heart. And what we do, we, we, help, we help them out by spreading the rumors. You know what? We're not prudent because we're not acting upon what knowledge. We're acting upon hearsays and assumptions. You can't do that. That is going to destroy a church. I'm going to say this, and maybe this will shock you, maybe it won't. But I'd say uh, about one-third of our church isn't here anymore because of that. Because people you came to me before they decided to walk out the door, so-and-so said this. And so-and-so said that. And so-and-so did this. And so-and-so did that. And I said, how come they have the right to do that? I said, I don't know. He says he does because so-and-so said that. The hearsay, the assumptions, and it destroyed people. And then you're, you're pegged as a church of gossips and critics and backbiters, and no one wants to come. getting awful quiet we know this a person who's prudent and a prudent man dealing with knowledge that means he goes by sound doctrine of the scriptures not hearsay not assumptions we know every word of God is pure so he goes by purity we would be a fool to make decisions and walk in this life outside the pure word of God you know what the Bible says in Proverbs 14 15 the simple believe every word Hmm? Every word. 
Are you fit in that category? But the prudent man looketh well to his goings. Means he's very cautious. He walks. He keeps his mouth shut. See, the Bible tells us that a tongue can be an evil thing or it can be a good thing. It could be, it's a fire. It, it's like the helm of a ship. It's like a bridle on a horse. See? The horse needs a bridle. I'm sorry, it's not like the bridle on a horse. It's like the horse. The horse needs a bridle. The, the, the ship needs a, needs a rudder. And the helm needs to be controlled. Or the rudder, I'm sorry. The rudder is your tongue. The, the helm is the control. So here you got, you got to be controlled. Your tongue needs a control. And the word of God is a control to every man's tongue. Let's try to get that out. <laughs> hmm? What it is, but so simple men believe every word, and so they go and spread every word they believe. And what happens with the prudent man? He looks well to his going. He won't say things if it, he keeps his tongue under control. He doesn't have to say everything that's on his mind. People say, I'll give you a piece of my mind. Well, you're due for a refund. <laughs> huh? Hey, man, I'm going to give you my two cents. <laughs> you're due for a refund, brother. Huh? You want to know what? You don't, have a, you don't have two cents that you can afford to give. Neither do I. We don't always have to give our two cents. We don't always have to have an opinion on things. Because, see, if we're going to say something that is not guided by knowledge of the Word of God, then we shouldn't say it. And that goes over real good, doesn't it? The simple man believes gossip and rumors and hearsay. He believes in assumptions. Huh? And we need to become prudent children of God and hear ye him. In our text verses, it says every prudent man. If you want to be prudent in the eyes of God, and that, by the way, that's God's vision. If you want to be prudent in the eyes of God, this will have to be the pathway you take. You've got to be under the word of God. You've got to deal with the knowledge of the Lord. Hmm? We need to let the Word of God be our guide in all things that we do, in all areas of our life. The prudent man must deal with God's Word and conform to the Scriptures and not the Scriptures conform to Him. I remember when I first, first look at it, I was a brand new saved Christian, just saved just a month or two, and I, I come across some Christians who had been saved for a while that I knew in school, and they got married, now they've been married for a couple years. I was doing some work on their house. And I got saved and um, went to a church function. Now this is 1982 now. <laughs> went to a church function. It was supposed to be a baptism. The ordinance of the church. Go to a baptism. They said we baptize on a Saturday because uh, we have to use a swimming pool because we don't have baptistry. So we, the guy said we can use it on Saturday. So they baptized people who got saved. And it was a charismatic church. And so we went to the baptism. And then they said, all right, after the baptism, everybody can jump in and swim. Well, they were so worldly that the women jumped in with bikinis that had less merit material than dental floss. And the men jumped in with a short, 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 shorts on, you know, almost a speedo kind of thing. And I'm like, really? Well, I jumped in because I was worldly. <laughs> you know, I just got saved. So I jumped in. And the Holy Spirit, as soon as I jumped in there, the Holy Spirit said, get out of the pool. He said, this isn't right. Now, that's what he spoke to my heart about. So I got out of the pool. They said, where are you going? I said, this isn't right. Well, the preacher said, I don't care what the preacher said. The Holy Ghost told me it wasn't right. Come out from among the and be separate, saith the Lord. Not touch not the unclean thing. And boy, there were some women in there that were unclean. Amen. So I walked away. So I went to those folks that I was working for were in that pool. So the next day, they questioned me, grilled me like I was on trial. <laughs> I mean, I felt like I was defending myself and my stand, and I was. And this is what they said. This is 2000, or 1982. Look at the, we don't conform to the word, but the word conforms to us. And man, they said the wrong thing to me, because I didn't know I was supposed to keep my mouth shut. I said, oh, no, we're to conform to the word of God. Bible says we're supposed to conform to it. Let this mind, let this mind be in you. Uh, what does, let this mind, uh, I'm trying to think of it. Let, uh, let this mind, in, that. okay, never mind about that verse. <laughs> I say it all the time. <laughs> huh? Uh, well, that's all right. 
We can go to Hebrews chapter 12 and we can quote that. Amen. Uh, be, be not uh, conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, but I was, I was talking about let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. That's what I was trying to say. For some reason I couldn't get it out. But so here it is. And I said that. And they said, oh no. God comes down to our level. And we'll, he'll conform to us. This is a, doesn't he know that this is a different time period and age? And this is what they're trying to teach me. Guess what? That was the last time I ever saw him. I said, I'm done here. I walked away. You said, you walked away? Yeah, I walked away. I had some conviction back then. <laughs> Should have conviction today, too. Look at it. I didn't need their money. I needed God. And so what I did is I went by the word of God and I said, no, I want to be a prudent man. I want to deal with knowledge. And so I said, no, I'm not conforming to, I'm not going to let or make God conform to me in the way I walk, but I want to conform to what he says to walk like. Mm -hmm. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So I'm to conform to him. Com we're supposed to conform, into, conform to his image. Mm -hmm. That's what we're supposed to do. And Christ wasn't in a pool with a bunch of bikinis. Huh? He wasn't wearing... Can you imagine? I, I mean, I think this almost may be sacrilege, but he wasn't in a Speedo. He didn't bear his nakedness. The only time his nakedness was bared when they took him to the cross, and he couldn't... He could, I mean, he could have stopped it, but I mean, it, had, it was part of his crucifixion. It was part of him being the sacrifice. Oh, laid open to an open shame. Before all men. I mean, he was totally naked. They don't, they don't portray him like that. He was totally naked. An open shame before all men. Huh? That isn't even right for our Savior to be that way, but that's what he allowed himself to be so that he could die for us and, and be sacrificed for our sin so we could have eternal life. And why would we then go ahead and open ourselves to an open shame like that and allow ourselves to get in a pool half naked or more than half naked and saying, it's all right because God, you know, conforming to us. Amen. Good assembly of God, people. <laughs> that was my first experience. By, by, by the way, God spoke to me a lot. It's funny. I go to assembly of God church on Wednesdays and going to an independent Baptist church on Sundays. <laughs> and uh, and uh, God spoke to me more at the, the charismatic church. He said, oh! <gasps> Really? Yeah. He said, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that, that's a lie, and that's a lie, and that's a lie. <laughs> I'm not joking. You know how I learned to, to study the Bible? From a preacher who was lying. Say, what, what do you mean? God says, you need to find out why he, you know he's lying. Why you think he's lying. Study that word. So you can not, not just assume that he's lying. You can say, no, thus saith the Lord. The Lord says this. You're wrong because you're contrary to his word. Not just for me to have an argument with him, which I didn't have an argument with him. It's so that I know for myself and know how to stay on the right pathway. And what was I, what I'm telling you right now is I was being a prudent man, being under the knowledge of the Lord and his word, so I'll know how to walk. And a lot of times, bad people came into my life to teach me how to read and study the Word of God so I'd have the knowledge. It even happens with people in the congregation. Find out why they're not right on things. You don't know, so what you do is you go to the Scriptures and find out. And they'll come in and act as if they got Scripture. And it's not. And you find out. Psalms 112. A good man, in verse 5, showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Where does he get that discretion from? From the Lord and his word. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 2, discretion will preserve thee. Hmm? God will preserve the Christian by his discretion. Proverbs chapter 2, you read it. I like Proverbs chapter 2. That's probably one of my favorite Proverbs. I like Proverbs 31 too. I think that's about the church. Uh, I mean, I think it's about 
a virtuous woman, but I also think it's about the church. And I, I said to a preacher, I said this to him. I said, let, let me ask you a question. Who should be the most virtuous woman in this world? He didn't know. He goes, uh, uh, uh. no, he's thinking walking women on the earth. You know, women, individual women and stuff. I said, the bride of Christ. And all of a sudden you hear, oh. I said, exactly. Christ doesn't want second best or third best. He wants the best. He says he's going to bring forth his bride. Huh? It's going to be perfect. It's going to be adorned in all its glory. Hmm? He wants a virtuous bride. So why wouldn't Proverbs 31 be about his bride? I don't know. So here in Proverbs 2, uh, I, I was talking about indiscretion, it, it preserved thee. He says he'll guide his affairs with discretion. That means he's going, to, he's going to analyze things under the scriptures, the light of the scriptures. And he's going to discern whether that's right or wrong. And he's going to go the way of right, because he's prudent, not the way of wrong. He's not going to be a fool and speak before he has all the facts. Hmm. How many times we do that? Seriously, how many times do we do that? We speak without facts. We speak without thinking. We speak, we speak without any information. We don't know the whole circumstances. I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. Opened our mouth. Inserted foot. Couldn't get any words out because of muffling through, through the shoe. Amen. Our foot was in the way. In fact, we get some foolish words out. And we lay open our folly. And then you say, and afterwards you say, man, that didn't come out right. <laughs> hmm? In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22 says this, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. A prudent man concealeth knowledge, hmm. but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. See, he concealeth knowledge. Look, he's not, by the way, when you find a guy that says, I know this, I know that, I'm so good, I know, I'm so knowledgeable, I am so smart. Look, at, I get away from that guy. Run from him. Because he's, he's bragging on himself. Look at, he shouldn't lift himself up. He is to let God lift him up. What does the foolish man do, it says here in verse 23? Huh? The heart of the fools proclaim foolishness. All he does, that's all that comes out of his mouth. That's all it's projected. Now, I don't have to tell you everything I know. I didn't know it was required. Now, that's a hard one. A lot of preachers want to tell you everything they know. My preacher used to say, don't tell everybody everything you know because they may ask you one more question than what you know. <laughs> if you understand what I just said, they may have more questions than you have answers. So don't tell them everything you know. I used to tell my wife all the time, you don't have to tell everybody what, what you know. You don't have to tell everybody, uh, give them all this information. If they ask you questions, just answer their questions. That's it. You don't have to add to the, their, the statements that you made. I'm, I'm talking like when we had the IRS situation. I'm talking like when we were taken to court by the government. I just answered their questions. I didn't have to lay out everything I know to them. Sometimes that might get you in trouble. You conceal knowledge. Hmm? You know when we went to court for this church here? I knew that they were wrong. But you know what? I didn't conceal. I, I concealed that I knew they were wrong. You know what I did instead? I taught them. Went in to teach them. I concealed the knowledge that God gave me. Look, God says they're wrong. I'll show you why. And he showed me. You know what? I didn't, I didn't teach him that. You know what I taught him? Why the church was founded by Jesus Christ and not by the government. Hmm? I, I let them come to their own conclusions that they were wrong. I'm just telling you. It does work. God's word is true. Hmm? Look over Proverbs chapter... 12 again in verse 24 it says this the hand of the diligent shall bear rule but the slothful shall be under tribute hmm? why is that because hmm? he's under knowledge 
I mean, we keep on going on. We can, we can read this whole thing and find it. The hand of diligence shall bear rule. He's diligent. Diligent at doing what? Hmm? Gaining knowledge? Seeking the Lord? Uh, uh, gaining wisdom and applying it? Huh? Have an understanding? Having his ears and eyes open? Diligent about keeping your ears and eyes open. Diligent about guarding your heart. Hmm? What does Proverbs chapter 15 mean in verse 2? Proverbs 15, 2 says this, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. He'll use the right. He, he not only conceals it, he doesn't only, he doesn't only want to uh, deal with knowledge, but he also, it says, also knows how to use knowledge. And then it says, but the mouth of fools pour out foolishness. He doesn't even, look at, have you ever heard a fool apply what he knows and it's so far out of context. <laughs> I have many a times. I'm saying, what are you saying that for? That don't even fit in here. Have anybody? I mean, kids are real good at that. Hmm? Why you go? Why all of a sudden you're flipping out? Why all of a sudden you're saying that? It has nothing to do with this. But see, what they see is an end to hurt somebody, an end to irritate somebody, an end to jab somebody. I think fools are damaging. I think they're destructive. And all of us at one time or another have been fools because the Bible says so. When we were lost, we were fools. And today we're hoping that we're prudent. Look over in verse 28 of Proverbs 15. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. Look at that. What's he studying? The knowledge of the word of God. But the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Where's he getting this evil stuff? I mean, he's got foolishness. He's got evilness. Where's he getting all that? What's he studying? Like I said to that atheist, he got all upset because I was thumping the Bible, he said. And I said, well, what book do you thump? You've got to be thumping something. <laughs> Where are you getting your information? Pouring out wickedness like this. Foolishness. Doesn't even make sense. Hmm. I like what one guy said. The greatest thing amongst man was the first step on the moon, but truly the greatest thing in history was God walking on earth. Hmm. <laughs> it was a great thing. He came here to die for us, walked on earth for those many years. 33 plus years. Mm -hmm. We'll go over in Isaiah chapter 52. You say, why do you say that? Because that, that there help you out. Man, we, we focus on the world's history. We talk about the, the, uh, the events in, the, in history of our world, like America. We think, by the way, we think America, Americans think America is like the center of all beginning of life. We're only 200, let me see, what are we, 200 and... 42 year, 43 years old, our country is. 243 years old. That's it. How long has Rome been there? Greece, Israel. Let's start out with Israel. Huh? How long have those nations been there? How long has Africa been there? That continent. And all the, na all the nations within it. Hmm? Egypt. You see Egypt in Genesis back in the beginning. The, the, if, you, you, see, you see it way back then, in the, in the beginning of Genesis, right back in the first few chapters. Well, actually, after six, chapter six, right in there. But you see it. Well, actually, you see the outline of it, um, Egypt when God's talking about the Garden of Eden. If you do any studying about all the rivers, the River Euphrates and the Tigris River and all that, you'll see Babylon. You'll see, uh, because uh, um, Babylon is Iraq. And uh, you'll see Iran, you'll see Egypt, you'll see the Middle East, you'll see Israel. I mean, you see all that? The land was there already. God outlines it by rivers. It was really kind of interesting. And I looked at that and I said, man. But my point is this. America isn't the center of all, all life. We're not the center of all beginning. So why would the walking on the moon be so significant compared to walk of Christ, walking on earth? They didn't write a book like this for the man walking on the moon. 
You know how many words they got for that event on the moon? Most of us know it or have heard of it. Hmm? Hmm. It's just a few lines. That's it. But God gave us a whole book, six, six books. Hmm. So I think this event is more important. Isaiah chapter 53. Did I tell you to turn there? I'm sorry. It's Isaiah chapter 52. Verse 13 says this. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. So if you're going to be prudent, you're going to, you're going to be uh, uh, dealing with knowledge, you're going to be a servant of God. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. That's what God does. When, you, when, when God exalts a man, that means he's on the right pathway. God doesn't exalt someone who's outside of his will. God doesn't exalt someone who's not following the will of the Lord, prudent, knowing Him, having the wisdom of God, having the knowledge, the, uh, the, uh, uh, accepting instruction, accepting rebuke and reproof. Hey, he's a, he, look at, he will exalt in due time. But He exalts a prudent man. Prudent man deals with knowledge. That's what He does. He's, he, well, by the way, He likes the knowledge of the Word of God why he deals with it he likes it it's look at i enjoy opening up my bible every day and finding something that god has for me and 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 there's not many days in my life as a christian that god hasn't talked to me through the scriptures i don't think i'm in an unusual individual i think he could do that with anybody in here from child to adult from from uh, uh boy girl woman man just saved, been saved for years. He can speak to you through the Word of God, but you've got to want it. You've got to say, I'm a prudent man. I'm going to be a prudent man, not a foolish man, and I want to deal with the knowledge of the Word of God. I do not want to open my folly. Boy, I'm telling you, when I got saved, seriously, God, taught, God worked on me about this. I remember I had a foul mouth. Everything came out of my mouth was folly. <laughs> hmm? Uh... I had four words in my vocabulary to tell people, and all of them I can't say to this day. So when I was in church, I wouldn't talk much. And the reason I wouldn't talk much is because I was afraid one of the words was going to slip out. And I didn't want to offend God, and I didn't want to offend the people in the church. And I thought it was inappropriate anyway to be in the church with those, that kind of language. I still think it's inappropriate. And so I wouldn't say anything. So when the preacher asked me to preach, I'm like, oh my soul, I better be prayed up. Because I may start going off on a tangent of cuss words. <laughs> I tell people, I, uh, I cuss. I, I use sentences just full of cuss words. Wouldn't have any other words in it. I don't know if an English teacher could have corrected it. <laughs> but I'd use, and, and you know what? And people would say, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm like, how do you know what I'm talking about, man? I'm saying things I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that was folly, and I lay it open. You know what that told me about them? They're just as big a fool as I was. So I was afraid of opening my folly or opening folly in the, front, in the presence of men. And Christians today aren't concerned about that anymore. They don't care. It's like they say, I don't care. I'll give them my peace of mind. I'll say what I want to say and no one's telling me any different. That means they just told me they're not going to be regulated. Hmm? They regulate trucks on the highway so they can only go up so, so fast. But Christians won't be regulated in their language. They don't care if uh, their evil communication corrupt good manners. They don't care about the evil things that come out of their mouth. I'm amazed at how many Christians are cursors, cussing. I've heard preachers cussing. I'm like, are you kidding me? One preacher told me, he says, pray for me. I have problems with cussing. I said, then you shouldn't be in the pulpit. That's exactly what I said to him. You shouldn't be in the pulpit then until you get that under control. Because, look, these kids don't need to hear the preacher cussing. Turn on Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Say, so what are you talking about? I'm talking about being, uh, being conformed to his image. Putting on the mind of Christ, being conformed to him. Being transformed by the renewing of your mind. By what? By the word of God. The word of God is going to transform you. You know what, the, you know Jesus Christ, he's one, he came up with this word. He knows this book. 
cover to cover. Even he could quote this book to us without opening it. You know what the mind of Christ is? It's his book. And we need to put this book in there so that we be conformed to his image. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. By the way, that is hard for uh, liberal Christians or Christians who don't, don't read their Bible very much or Christians who are in the more liberal churches because they don't memorize Scripture. Have you ever heard them memorize NIV, ESV? Huh? Hear them memorize uh, these other perverted Scriptures? Boy, I'm telling you, I've heard some memorize it and it's weak as water. And then most of them don't memorize Scripture. They don't even know doctrine. They don't know doctrine. Bring up doctrine amongst them and you'll have a fight. Doctrine always brings up a fight amongst those who are ignorant. Someone's going to be offended by it. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 says this, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. How are you going to be wise as a serpent? You better have the knowledge of the Lord. It means you're going to have to be prudent. A prudent man who deal, deals with knowledge. God did. Look, at this is not a suggestion. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as servant, harmless as dove. That's a, that is not a suggestion. That is a command. So if you're not going to listen to God, if you're not going to get into his word, if you're not going to study it, what are you living for Christ for then? What is your motive? What is your motivation? It won't be long before you're not in the... In the church, I, look at many of the people who have left our, our church. I asked them, and I said this this morning, uh, do you, did you read your Bible? When, did, when was the last time you read your Bible? And often it's a long time ago. I said, did you pray? Have you prayed? Well, it's been a long time ago. You ever tell anybody about Jesus? Well, that's been a long time ago. Well, there it is. Look at you. Not, you don't have any desire for the things of God. That's why you're dying. What you did is you, you cut yourself off from the vine. You have gaining no nourishment. And someone who is not nourished starves to death and dies. It's all that can happen. You're on the path. Look, at if I take a bottle away from a baby and never feed that baby, it won't be long before that baby is not alive anymore. That baby be dead. If I tell, tell that baby you can't have any more formula, you know, three months old, can't have any more formula, you're done. You know, the babies have more sense than Christians. You know what the baby's going to do? Anybody know? Cry, scream, throw fit. I go, I go six hours, eight hours without feeding it. It's going to be screaming. It's going to irritate me. I'm going to want to give it a bottle. <laughs> but Christians won't do that. We'll go weeks and months without nourishment. Then wonder why we die on the vine. Isn't that interesting? That's the terminology. Dying on the vine. And God, you know what God says he does with those? He cuts them off and he puts them in the fire and burns them up. Doesn't mean he sends them to hell. Huh? Doesn't mean he sends them to hell. That's not what I'm talking about. Because if you read that right, he's not talking about being cast into everlasting darkness. Where there's we weeping and gnashing of teeth. Huh? Not what he's talking about. You, 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 you have your reward. You are judged. And just figure it out yourself. In Romans chapter 16, verse 19. I am just being encouraging on you tonight, aren't I? Yeah. You want know why? Because a lot of Christians don't do this. No, they don't have any desire to seek the knowledge of God's word. Romans 16, verse 19. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. What is that? God's letting men, all men know about your obedience. That means he's exalting you. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. See, often we're, simp we're not simple concerning evil. We're simple in the concerning the word of God. But we're wise, worldly wise in evil. Listen, we've had people in this church. And they start talking about evil things, and they have all this knowledge. And I sit there going, sounds like you, get indul you indulge in it. You do. That's why you talk about it. That's why you got so much knowledge about it. But when it comes to the Word of God, you're so simple, you don't even know what the Word of God has to say. 
So that makes you a fool. Hmm? We're supposed to be simple concerning evil. That means you kids should not know about evil things. That's why I won't tell you all the intricate details of my wicked life that I lived before. Because you don't need to know. What you need to know is the good things of this word. And that's where you're going to find it. Good is in this book. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Hopefully you, you'll see God and his word tonight. Say, God, I need to seek your word. I need to be a prudent man dealeth with knowledge, dealing with knowledge. In chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, verse 20 says this, Brethren, be not children in understanding. Did you get that? Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. You know what he just said? He said you should be men. You're mature enough to get knowledge of the word of God. Don't be so mature in this fact that you have hatred. And it's, listen, the hatred that's in you is so cultivated that you know how to use it. And you know how to be, uh, spew venom into lives of other men. That makes you a man in malice. He says, be children in malice. You know what that means? Children have disagreements. They get it right, and they're best friends afterwards. Hmm? I remember doing that with my friends when I was a kid. We'd have a disagreement. We'd get in a fight about it. We'd argue about it. We'd say things to each other. Then we'd say we're sorry, and we'd go back on playing, doing what's right. We'd, we'd become friends. We didn't, we didn't hold it against one another. But that's not what we do today. We're too mature to say I'm sorry. Too mature to humble ourselves before God and before man. And that's what he's telling us. We need to not be so mature. Uh, don't be children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children. Hmm? Don't, don't, don't let hatred take you. Don't let it take you. And it will. And then, by the way, hatred's easy to let take you. All you do is dwell on it for a while. Dwell on a circumstance for a while, and eventually you'll be beside yourself, and it'll eat you alive. And you're, just, you're a child. You're a child, but you're a man or a woman. You're a grown-up getting eaten up by malice, hatred, sin. When you need to be like a child. Well, I can forgive him on that. Oh, we'll go be friends. Huh? We can get along now. There's no problem with it. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding that the will of the Lord is. What the will of the Lord is. Don't be, look, it said, don't be unwise about it. About understanding. But know the will of the Lord. What is the will of the Lord? Hmm? Let me show you something here. In 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. We need to conform to God's word. In 1 Samuel chapter 25 verse 10 says this. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Now he knew who David was because David helped him out by this time. David helped him and helped his servants. And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. And in verse 11 says this, Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? So basically he, he doesn't repay the man for helping him. Guy helps him and the guy is in need of help. David's men are in need of help and he won't help them. Huh? In verse 17, it says this. Now, therefore, know and consider that what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. And that sounds like a lot of Christians. There's, there's Christians that were in our church that I couldn't counsel. I mean, if my life depended on it. I would tell them, I said, I cannot pastor you. Why? Because you will not listen. That's what Nabal was, an unpastoral person. David, king of Israel, could not tell him anything. Hmm? 
And so he, Isaiah considered him a man of Belial. You cannot speak to him. Hmm? So you look at verse 25 then. Let not my Lord, I pray thee. Now this is Abigail, the wife of Nabal. She comes to David and said, Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. Should have said folly is his game. <laughs> folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now David was coming to kill Nabal. He's going to not just him, but his whole household. Abigail would have been killed. Their children would have been killed. Nabal would have been killed. The servants would have been killed. Their house would have been obliterated, destroyed. Because of Nabal's foolishness. He laid open his folly and said, I don't care. When I was in need, David helped me and I, I got help from him. And he, basically, he deserved to help me. <laughs> you know. So then David's in need and he won't help him. And he... he Treats him horribly, sends him away, uh, packing, you know, uh, doesn't, give him a, doesn't give him a morsel of food. Says, I'm not giving you the food that I give to my servants. I'm not giving to you. So David comes to kill him and someone who was wise came out because she believed in knowledge. Her name was Abigail. And she came out with knowledge. I understand. I didn't see these servants, but I understand my husband is a son of Belial. He is foolish. Hmm? She said, forgive him. Forgive us. Don't destroy us. And David said to her, thank you for stopping me from doing this evil. The king of Israel. Nabal wasn't killed by David. God killed him. Turned his heart to stone. Within 10 days he was dead. We had first people in our church that were like that. And I believe God turned their heart to stone. And they don't have anything to do with God today. So what do you mean? They have no desire in their heart. Their heart is hard, their heart is hard as stone. It's rock hard. They could, you, couldn't, you couldn't get a word, word in edgewise about the word of God to them. I've actually had people that used to be in our church, and I'll say, well, the Bible says, I don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. Oh, dude, a couple of years ago, you were sitting on the edge of your seat listening to the Word of God and enjoying it, saying amen, and tears coming to your eyes, and now I don't want to hear what the Word of God has to say. They found Nabal in their life. They didn't find Christ. Hmm? They found how to be hard-hearted, not tender-hearted. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 3, I'll finish with this. Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him. And he saith to everyone that he is a fool. Go ahead, go outside the scriptures. You're going to tell people with your life, I'm a fool. And the wisdom that you gain will fail you. Let me put it this way. Remember I told you about that that woman who was head of religious studies at the University of California and I talked to her and she had all these degrees so that she could be the head professor at the University of California in religious studies she was lifted up as a very wise woman of religious studies I worked for a guy who owned a Dairy Queen who went to UCLA you know what his major was religious studies both those people it was just a few minutes I only had to talk to them and they were put under the table about their religious studies. All their wisdom that they gained failed them because I started taking them through truth and their religious studies couldn't keep up with them. And the woman at the uh, University of California got upset and told me, I'm not talking to you anymore. The other, guys, the other guy just laughed and he wouldn't talk to me about religious studies anymore. <laughs> in fact, after I got done working on him, by the way, he committed suicide. That was too bad. I, I liked the guy. He was, he was from the Middle East. And, uh, but he committed suicide. Couldn't believe it when they told me. But he told me, he says, you know what I'm going to do at my drive-up window at the Dairy Queen I own? I said, what's that? He goes, I'm going to put a curtain up there, and you're going to come up there, and you're going to, people are going to drive up to the window, and you're going to take their confessions of sin. <laughs> 
<laughs> I said, really? I said, I'm not that kind of priest, amen. <laughs> I'm in the priesthood of the believer, not a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. I said, I'm saved, born again, bought by the blood. And I tried to get the gospel across to him. But his religious studies got in his way. They failed him. You know what? We got to be prudent and seek the knowledge of the Lord. And deal with it on a daily basis. And if you miss a day, don't let too much time go by. Get back into it. Because you let enough time go by. Your heart's going to become hard to it. And you'll have trouble picking up that book. You'll struggle opening this book because it's going to be convicting. The devil's going to say, why do you need to do that, man? Look at we got something else you can do today. You don't have to sit down and read your Bible. Man, you're wasting your time. All these things will be said to you. You need to sit down, take time, and waste your time if so be. I'm going to waste my time reading the Bible. <laughs> It's not a waste. This is very productive. I'm telling you. Many a men got in the word of God and become very productive Christians. Want to know why? Because they dealt with the knowledge of the Lord. By the way, God's not trying to hide it from you. He's not trying to hide knowledge from you. He wants you to have it worse than you want it. So he's... The Bible says, if you read Proverbs, I dare you read Proverbs and read about wisdom. Every time you see wisdom, look at where wisdom's at. Every time. Wisdom's never hid from man. Never. It's in the city. It's at the doors of the gate. It's at your door. Hey, it's open, waiting for you to collect it. Hey, I'm wisdom. Come and hear what I got to say. Our church. Come in and hear what has to be said. Trying to give you some wisdom. Hey, he says, hey, I'm sitting on your nightstand. I'm sitting on your coffee table. I got some wisdom here. It's in the door of your gates. I want you to hear the wisdom that I have for you. Hey, here it is. Look at it. It's open to you. I can open it right now and open it up to wisdom. He's not hiding it from you. It's what we do want to do with it. What we want, what, what our motive is, what... Our desire is. Don't be one of those people who just want to know this book so you can argue with people. There's so many people like that. Preachers like that. I try to learn this book so I can know how to walk. <laughs> and then as a preacher, so I can teach others how to walk. Uh, so many people contend with, listen to this carefully, they all want to know prophecy today. And I said, well, will prophecy teach me how to walk with God? I said, I, I appreciate God put prophecy in there, and I will learn some, but that is going to be like a secondary learning. But my main concern is how to walk with the Lord today, how to get hold of Him. Why is everybody learning prophecy when they don't even know how to get hold of God? Seriously. We were at a church one time. I was traveling. And I was a member of this church, but I was traveling and preaching, and I'd come back. I'd come back every two months to the church. The preacher was still in the same thing for several years, the same thing he was on. You know what it was all? Prophecy. All his messages were prophecy. Then he decided, I'm going to get on teaching you what the Mormons believe. We did the same thing. We're gone for a year, come back, he's still on the same thing. My wife and I look at each other like, this isn't edifying for my walk in Christ at all. I said, I don't care what the Mormons believe. I really don't. I, all, I, I know the basics of what they know, and I can talk to them and say, this is what you believe. And I said, and I, it's not Bible. And they can come up with all this other stuff and all these other arguments, but I'm going to tell you, all I do is bring out the truth, and their wisdom fails them. This is, what, this is what I base my learning on right here. And I, don't, I, don't have, I know what prophecy is. I know that God's fulfilling prophecy. He fulfilled prophecy in Christ. He's going to fulfill prophecy in the return of Christ. You know, he's going to fulfill prophecy in the tribulation, in the millennial, in the millennium. I know he's going to fulfill prophecy in the Armageddon. And, 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 and all these things are going to happen. And they're going to destruction of the earth. And everything's going to be burned with a fervent heat. I understand all that. Okay, now I'm going to go on. And how do I walk with God now? 
I need to walk with God. I need to know my God. There's so many people who don't know God. And I sit there going, really? You really believe that about God? <laughs> and you're a Christian? Our Heavenly Father, we just ask you to help us. Help us understand what we heard. The Bible tells us, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. For three things we notice here, it was written to us, that we can know and that we can believe. All before we leave this earth, we can know consciously in our hearts and in our minds that we are saved before we leave this earth. God has made a promise to us. He tells us there's none righteous, no, not one in Romans 3.10. Why aren't we righteous? Because Romans 3.23 tells us, and we know because of that we cannot get ourselves to heaven on our own power because sin is a weight to us and keeps us bound to this old earth. And without Christ, we're going to find ourselves in a devil's hell. We find out in Romans chapter uh, 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That means that we have to pay a penalty for our sin. And that penalty, that wage is death. And that's what it says, for the wages of sin is death. But we know that there's more than one wage because wage is plural there. So that means there's more than one. We find out that there's two wages. The first of all, we have the death of our body and then we have the death of our soul. In Revelation 21, 8, it says, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake with burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's the second death. The first death, the death of our bodies as we quit breathing on this earth. The second death is our, the judgment of our soul. Our soul will be cast into hell without Christ. That's because all of us have fit and that list that God has for those who will go to, go to hell or to the lake of fire. And what we found out is in for the wages of sin is death in, Revel in Romans chapter 6, 23, is this. The second part of that says, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the grace and mercy of God. God has given us a way out. How do we get out? He's given us a gift. That gift is from God. That gift is eternal life. And that gift is through Jesus Christ. Not any other way. The Bible tells us in John 14, 6, it says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what Jesus Christ said. And so we know that our only way to heaven and getting to the Father is through Jesus Christ. We know this, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for sinners. He knew our condition. He knew our state. He knew that we were sinners. He knew that we had evil and wickedness within us, yet he died for us. That's how much compassion and love he has for us. That's why John 3, 16, it tells us, but, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and God wanted us to have everlasting life through his son Jesus Christ who was given for us on Calvary he was uh, he was crucified buried rose again he shed his blood and he sits on the right hand of the father to this day we know this that God says if you want to trust me here's how you do it for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He tells us with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We need to call on Jesus Christ. We need to with our whole heart give our life. Give our heart to him. And tell him that you're ready to accept him as his, your savior. And Jesus Christ to come move in into your heart. And the Holy Spirit of God to move in. And tell him you love him. And tell him you'll serve him for the rest of your life. And we'd like to you right now. If you bow your head and invite Jesus Christ into your life, all you have to do is just pray and ask him to, to come into your life and come into your heart. Just tell him you want him as your savior. I know there's some out there that might be hurting right now and might be burdened, might be needing a savior right now. I know all men need a savior, but not all men know they need a savior. And those who know right now, will you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior?